Welcome back to another how-to on things you probably already know how to do or not, maybe. So if you've been following our progression throughout the season, you may know that we've been dealing with a lot of cooling issues. Well, we traced the issue back to a bad radiator. Somehow, everything tested out good on the radiator. Everything was pointing towards a head gasket. We put in a head gasket and still no bueno. It still overheated. I borrowed a radiator out of Matt's IS300 and it fixed the problem. Well, he needed the radiator back and when we were in St. Louis, one of Taylor Hole's guys, Ernest, he actually had a CSF radiator that he sold us for a pretty good deal. Thanks, dude. So we took some time, put it in the car. I'll show you that in a second. So I've actually been trying to bleed the radiator for the last three days. I initially vacuum bled it, but I don't think all the water was out of the system when I vacuum bled it, so it didn't vacuum bleed properly. So after vacuum bleeding it, I always put a funnel on just to try to get small air bubbles that maybe didn't get worked out with vacuum bleeding it. And I, was, I had a funnel on it for three days trying to get all that out and it still wanted to overheat at idle. Whereas Matt's radiator, when we put it in, it would stay 170 across the board all throughout idle. So today I'm gonna to be walking you through how to properly vacuum bleed. Might not even be proper. I just kind of learned about it a month ago or whatever, so I might not even be doing it properly. But we're gonna walk you through it. So this is our new CSF radiator. We have the radiator, our heat exchanger for the supercharger. We ended up taking, spending a lot of time making a carbon fiber shroud with new fans. Now we have to bleed it. So what we gotta do first is go to the front of the car and drain all the coolant. Now granted you could drain it from back there, but I'm actually just gonna hook it up unhook the lines from the water pump and let it drain. Once it's drained, I'm actually gonna take a vacuum and try to suck all of the fluid out. So first thing I'm gonna do is take this line off, un undo the bad boy, and come on, let it come out. Now we do have a lot of water actually in our system, so it's probably gonna be draining for a little while. Everything's green in the system. No, we do not use coolant. It is water only. When we were dealing with our cooling issues after New Jersey, we bought this dye that actually goes through the water system. It makes everything green, but when you take a light to it, like a black light, you can find all your leaks. One of our thoughts we were having was there was, gonna, there was leaks in the system. Turns out we were fine and there wasn't any leaks but we put it in just as a precautionary thing the dumb thing is we've drained this system like four times and everything is still green so it's just something we're going to be dealing with for the rest of the year i've tried flushing it and just a little bit of green makes everything green sucks now that it's mostly drained out i'm going to take a vacuum my old vacuum right here walmart bad boy vacuum this hose and then come over here and then vacuum this fitting over here. After that's done, I'm going to take this line off and try to do the same thing just to really make sure I have all of the water out. As you can see, we run a normal water pump with a little billet like thermostat adapter to be able to run an AN line on. Now that it's ready, I'm gonna bring all the tools needed back to the radiator section and we'll go from there. All right, quick walkthrough on everything we need. First off is an air compressor. Yes, we have an air compressor way back there. You can probably see it. But uh, the water separator, which is this back black piece right there, has a crack in it so it doesn't work. So we took the air compressor out of our race trailer because we bring one with. It's always nice to have some sort of air source when you're at a race event. We brought it out of the trailer. It's gonna be helping us today. Now we have our water that's gonna go into the system. Three gallons should be enough for the system. I have more if I need to. We'll cross that road when we get here. A bucket and the tool. It is a Harbor Freight Special. Well, it seems to work great. First thing I gotta do is actually plug this in and get some air. We have, we might actually be enough. We might actually be good. We have 120 PSI there. 
95 here. We're only going to be using about 35, 36 PSI, so give it a shot actually with how it is and go from there. So first thing to do, open these bad boys up. Open them up, put them in here. So, oh, seal's still on. So what we're going to do here is little DIY magic, put that in there and boom, water magic. I did forget to actually tighten the fittings up there, so I'm gonna go do that and then come back here and we'll get into this bad boy. And that was quick, fittings are tight, so let's get into this bad boy. Like I said, Harbor Freight Special. Here you have your vacuum bleeder kit. It's pretty much what it is. So now you have these rubber grommets that go into where the radiator cap sits. We already know that ours is a 31 millimeter size, so we already have that on, but I'll show you real quickly how that works. So pull your radiator cap, and basically these rubber pieces will sit right here. Granted, this one's too big, so it does not work. From there, you get this. You put the rubber grommet on the vacuum bleeder, and that slides on right like so. Tighten this up and go from there. So you gotta make sure it's seated properly and then just let me get this hose out of the way. Get this fitting tight. You always wanna push down on it just so the rubber piece doesn't fall out as you tighten it. Get it pretty much as tight as you can give it. And voila, it's super easy to use. Air goes in here, your water comes through here. Make sure the fittings are at a 90 degree angle from where the lines come in. So this one's 90, it's completely shut. This one's 90, completely shut. Let's hook up the air and we'll go from there. Boom, line is hooked up. I actually cranked up our tool pressure just to match our tank pressure. I already know it's gonna drop, this thing isn't plugged in, that's fine. Once you have that set up, you're gonna slowly release this valve and you'll see air will be coming out of this fitting and you'll slowly start to get pressure, which is a vacuum, inside the system. All right, once this has been open for a while, you'll see the gauge come up. Right now we're at a little bit above 25, 26. You'll get anywhere from 23 to 26, whatever, that seems to be normal. You're gonna keep this valve shut. You don't need your air anymore, that can go away. And you're gonna watch this gauge for a couple minutes to see if it drops. All right, so it's been on for a little bit. I dropped maybe 0.2 of a PSI, which is seems to be fine. All the cars we've done, done it on, it drops anywhere from one to two PSI, and that just seems pretty standard. So from there, I'm gonna hook up this line, put that line, hold it in the bucket, and slowly release this until it's all the way straight stationary and it'll pull water because this is vacuum right now we have 25 psi vacuum it'll pull all the water from the bucket into the system and we're going to go until it reaches zero it is worth mentioning your water is supposed to be about the same level as your funnel so i'm going to move this to the second level hopefully anyways That's about level. It's about the same size. Move this. I'm just going to be very careful not to disrupt that because I don't want the seal breaking, that rubber seal. I don't want it breaking out. So put that all the way in the bucket and hold it there. You want to make sure it's held there. You're going to slowly open this up, allow vacuum to come in. It's going to break that vacuum seal. You'll be able to hear it. You'll be able to see the water slowly coming in. As it comes in, you can start opening this valve even more. Just slowly open the valve up until it's a stationary level where you can have it fully perpendicular, fully open. Now it's fully open, so I'm just going to let it suck in all the water and hope water, hope I have enough. So I'm actually running out of water. My dumb dummy, I'm gonna shut that valve. Try to figure out a way so this isn't gonna fall. Really hope I don't have to redo this again. All right, just don't touch it. That should be more than enough now. 
I started with three gallons, this is another two, so there's no way this system is five gallons. It's hot in the shop, I'm sweating. So we're at zero, so you shut the line, now you're good. This can come out of water, just let that kind of hang. Pull your hose off, and you can unhook this piece, loosen it up, pull it off, boom. Now it's vacuum blit. So what I'm going to do now is take that bucket, pour it into these individual gallon size water bottle. That way I can get a reference as far as how much water actually went into this system. Now when I had vacuum blood it the first time with this new radiator, it only took about a gallon and a half of water. So I knew something had to have been messed up. When we first started doing this today, it took about two and a half gallons before I had to add more water because I only had three gallons in the system. So we know something's off in one of those sections. So I put the water back in its original jugs. Turns out I probably didn't need these two gallons that I put into the bucket, but it's better safe than sorry. We have a third of a gallon here, so this thing used two and two thirds, which like I said earlier, we only ended up putting in about a gallon and a half the first time. So we're already looking better with water in the system. Now I'm gonna put our normal standard funnel on the setup because there's always gonna be a little bit of air on the top. Then I'll put more in, we'll start it up, try to do the natural bleeding wave from there. Grab the bottle. So I'll fill it up eh, about right here or so. Give it room to breathe. All right, so I did have to shut it off because it got hot again, but it was perfectly fine. Got up to 175 degrees. The fans were blowing cold air, so the radiator wasn't even hot, and it started to bubble at about 195 or so. I let it let it run up to 205. This water is still ice f***ing cold. Sorry for swearing. So I'm just going to do this a few times. We did get air bubbles coming out, so... I'm just going to start it, stop it, start it, stop it, make sure that doesn't get too hot, boil out all of our fluid. Something to note, it is an ethanol car, but no matter what car you're working on, always make sure you have proper airflow. We have a fan up there that pulls nice air out. It's really hot, so I don't want this all the way up, but I did crack it just so I didn't die. So yeah, I'm going to start it, stop it. You don't really need to see that. Something worth mentioning, as everyone should know, when things heat up, it expands. Levels go up, when things cool, levels go down, things contract. The engine's reading 210 or 210, 205 to 210, and all these lines are still ice cold. So it's not actually flowing all the way yet. So I'm going to be taking some water out, because I know that's not 210 degrees. So I'm going to take it out just so it doesn't overfill, put it in our containers, and keep going. All right, so just a little update. I've been starting, stopping, starting, stopping, and every time I do so, we always pull more air bubbles. Turns out these triple pass radiators are actually super hard to bleed, even with vacuum bleeding it. I actually called CSF, the manufacturer of this triple pass, and kind of walked them through everything that we've been dealing with, and he just says, like, just keep trying to bleed it. Everything Heating wise sounds like a cooling coolant bleeding issues. So also reading onto some forms a lot of people in the BMW world Which I know it's not a BMW and we don't have all that stuff when they put this radiator in They also have bleeding issues once they bleed it everything works better than before obviously so They say you have to just continuously try bleeding it like running through this funnel system but Starting it, stopping it, letting it sit overnight, and then running running it again the following morning if there's still issues. And we're just going to do that. I've been working on this for a while trying to do it. Matt actually came by and helped. 
yeah, so I'm gonna let it sit overnight. I filled the coolant up, water or whatever. Like I said, this green stuff, that's dye, and it just, it's, it's hard to get out. So I marked the level, and I'm just gonna let it sit overnight. We're gonna come back tomorrow, we're gonna check it out. Hopefully it goes down, that, no, that means we're onto something, and we're gonna keep it going, we're gonna try. So I know this was supposed to be a how-to video, but we're kind of at a loss. Um, Turns out these triple pass radiators are super tricky to bleed even with vacuum bleeding it. I actually spoke with CSF yesterday and he kind of just said run through the process and just keep doing what we're doing. We bled it last night and basically what they said to do is do the normal bleeding process, fill the funnel, leave it overnight, see if the level's dropped and then continue the process until you can get all the air out. Now, we're still pulling air so I'm assuming it's just not bled properly. We're just gonna keep at it. Basically what I'm doing now is I'm starting it, trying to get all the air out, letting it, shutting it off at like 200 degrees or whatever, and then just letting it sit for a couple hours and try to let everything cool off and then repeat the process. Takes time, which sucks, but it's our kind of, not only option, but it's our best option to keep the temps down in Utah, so we're just gonna keep doing this. If all else fails, we'll put the radiator that we stole out of the IS300 back in. But I actually just shut the car off like a couple minutes ago. There's flies everywhere. Like a couple minutes ago and we're still pulling air bubbles. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah, you see that air bubble? I mean, the car's been off for a couple minutes. So maybe it just needs to be bled a bunch. Anyways, I'm gonna keep at it. I've got a bunch of other projects in the shop I gotta do while this cools off, so I'll check back if anything changes. Day five, six, eight, twelve, I don't even know, but it works, it's finished, we're good to go. So let me just give you a quick backstory. Last year we ran a mechanical water pump on the engine and an electric water pump. We didn't have any issues all last year. This year, we also didn't have issues in Atlanta, and then we started to get issues from, honestly, we don't even really know what exactly caused it, but we got issues after Atlanta. Turns out it was just a radiator. When we got back from New Jersey, it was, I mean, it got up to like 280 degrees, 260 before I even left the line on like my second battle or whatever, second run on fifth battle or whatnot, I don't even remember. We thought it was a head gasket, all the signs pointed towards a head gasket. We took the head gasket out, replaced it, got the heads deck from Dory. He ended up not even having to deck that much, so we knew the head gasket was actually probably fine. Talking with Rome, yes, Rome CP, Rome Charpentier, however you wanna say it, He's been helping us a lot throughout like last year, this year, and even the year before last year, <laughs> just kind of walking us through some stuff, getting us ready for pro, getting us, like just helping everything in general. He said he doesn't even run a secondary electric pump, that everything should be fine without it. So we did, still kind of had issues, but we pulled that, um, ended up putting, the, putting Matt's IS300 radiator in without the electric pump. Everything worked. Got this triple pass. Now, as you've been following along, it's, uh, it was quite the B to bleed. I've been bleeding it for the past like five days. Every time I talk to CSF or a triple pass person or whoever, they always say like, let it get up to operating temperature, get all the air bubbles out, shut it off, let it sit overnight. So I did that for like five days. No bueno. Finally, Matt, our crew chief was like, hey, you should try the electric pump again. So I put the electric pump in this morning, bled it without running the car, because you can do that with electric. I actually vacuum bled it first and then funnel bled it. Got a lot of the air bubbles out, started it up, let it warm up to operating temperature without turning the electric pump on. So I got it up to like 170, turned the pump on, dropped to like 150. What? So then let it get up even hotter to 185. It's like, maybe it was just fluke. Turn the electric pump on again. I mean, a lot of air bubbles are still coming out, but it dropped from 185 to 170. What? And then got it up to 200. I was like, maybe, you know, whatever. Let's see if it really does it. So I turned the electric pump off, let it, the engine get up to 200, turn the electric pump on, comes, <laughs> comes down to 170 again. So now I actually have to order fittings to make this electric pump work. I just ghettoly ran it, and I'll show, show you that here in a second. 
But if you've made it this far in the video, maybe you just have to do what I did and run the electric pump as well. How I have it is I have the mechanical pump coming off the engine, feeding into the radiator up top here. It goes through the radiator down here, comes out of the radiator into the electric pump, then back into the engine. So the way our supercharger is set up, it's got the LSA water pump belt drive and everything, and nobody makes a electric water pump or water pump adapter that I've found for this setup. So you kind of have to run the mechanical. Like you can't just put fittings on the end of the block and run an electric to that because you need that water pump with the pulley drive setup to run the supercharger. And I'll show you that here in a second, but let's check out my ghetto electric pump. So we have the electric Mazir way down there. It's the only place I could fit it. I have a 90 degree fitting coming up and it's ghetto ran over here. Now I will probably get a 180 fitting or figure out a better place for that. Got a ghetto 45 degree over here. It's pretty kinked, which still cools. It works. I'll make it better before the round. This is just what I had laying around. We've been through so many different radiator interchanges all throughout this year and everything always has different inlets. So I've been having to having to make lines like every year. And this is just what we had. I didn't have any extras around the shop as far as just sole fittings go. So I just used what I had. It's really ghetto, but I just wanted to test the theory. I'll show you why I cannot run just a normal electric pump. So our supercharger is up here. The bracket tree that we use is all LSA driven. So there's actually bolts on this water pump that this bracket that holds this pulley, that pulley, that pulley, all bolt to for our supercharger. This one goes off the head, so that doesn't matter. But I haven't found a good solution not to use that yet, so this is what we got. If you made it this far, thank you for checking it out. I've been really stressing over this. I mean, we've had cooling issues all year, and maybe it's finally fixed for the fourth and final round. If you have any questions, um, definitely post them in the chats or message us. It's kind of hard to actually like monitor that stuff. It doesn't really tell me, but I try to look at it every now and then. So definitely if you have questions, otherwise, check out my Instagram and maybe I'll be able to help you then. Yeah, we don't know a lot. We're just kind of learning as we go. This is a learning curve. Stay tuned until next time.